Welcome to the podcast hosted by TimeCam.com on how to stay on top of your work. Welcome to the 26th episode of Stay on Top of Your Work podcast. I'm Kate, your host, and today I have a fresh dose of tips on project management and to be more specific, on the lazy project management. And today my guest is Peter Taylor, the man behind the lazy project manager. Peter is a blogger, speaker, podcaster, and the author of two best-selling books on productive laziness, The Lazy Winner and The Lazy Project Manager, as well as many other titles. Peter, thank you so much for joining me here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Sure, my pleasure as well. Um, who is a lazy project manager? I think <laughs> this is quite an um, extraordinary uh, approach to project management, to be a lazy project manager. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and explain us what is uh, you know laziness and project manager? Sure. Okay. So um, so there's a story behind this, how it came about. <clears throat> I was working. Uh, so apart from the uh, speaking and, and writing, etc., I do have a I have a proper job, and I've been heading up uh, PMOs for some time. And in one organisation, I had over a hundred project managers working for me, and I'd identified that half the group were working kind of uh, um, successfully, not you know never never perfection, of course, but really quite good work and they were working on average typical working weeks projects go up and down we know that but on average they were working 40 45 hour weeks type thing and the other half were working crazy hours 60 70 80 hours a week regularly and you know what they were no more successful and i was talking to my manager at the time and he said well but they, peter it's because they're not like you because you are the laziest person i've ever met and i was i was kind of upset to begin with because i thought well this guy i've worked with three companies um, and I thought he liked me and now he's calling me lazy, but actually he was describing a style I had evolved over a period of time. And really the essence of it, I talk about productive laziness. It's, it's working smarter, not harder. That's, that's the essence. And so with that group of project managers, I was able to look at how they were working, what meetings they're involved in, what conversations, calls, what decision-making, how much they delegated, all of that. And from that came the idea around the lazy project manager. And then I, I just liked it. I thought, well, project managers, lazy. That's a combination that would uh, perhaps insult your profession and get popular or get known at least. And I put the two together and hence the lazy project manager was born. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so what is the, the exact science behind the laziness in project management? And um, the question that comes to my mind is how do you organize your time uh, and how do you, you know, perform all the tasks when being a, a productively lazy? <laughs> yes, I mean that's the key. I mean, really, and part of the challenge, really, because the I think the best description of of the lazy project manager book was by someone who said it's about managing yourself whilst you're managing projects. It's about your time as a, pro a project manager, and actually, the principles apply to everybody. Whatever you're doing, you have to think about things. So the first thing I talk about is the 80-20 rule. I mean, everybody knows the 80-20 rule. It was based on original work by Wilfredo Pareto, the Italian economist. But Joseph Duran, the management thinker, took this and evolved it into um, some of the concepts we know today. And the 80-20 rule exists. So what I say to people is, you know, you as a manager, you as a, a leader, you as an individual, you as a project manager, don't come into work and just start working on your work to-do list because we all have to-do lists. But the challenge is, what is the what are the priority points on this to-do list? And actually, it's what are the 20% of things you have to do that deliver the 80% of return on your personal investment? That's the key. So what I tell people is, look, the night before, on the bus, on the train, in the car, on the way to work, whilst you're having that first cup of coffee, think about your day. You know, what is it you should be focusing on? Because the problem is, if we turn up at work, and we get a cup of coffee, we book a meeting room, we order some cabbages online through shopping or something like that. We we get a new pen, we do this, we do that. We haven't actually made that much progress. We've ticked five or six things off our to-do list, but the reality is we haven't made significant progress. So what I tell people is, look, just think about it. What do you think is the most important thing you should do today? Now, we operate in the, the, the an environment of other people's uh, demands upon us. You can't just suddenly ignore things you have to do for your manager or other people. But you should think about it. What is the what is the twenty percent that delivers the eighty percent return on on benefit on your personal time? Because if you achieve that, 
then you're going to make progress. You're going to feel very energized, very positive, and you're going to make great progress and help others make progress as well. And I wanted to ask, ask you uh, how to manage projects having uh, that concept of laziness in mind, but you uh, actually kind of answered that question, but maybe there is something more to that than just this 80-20 rule. Oh, there is. I mean, the other thing which I talk about in the book is um, some analysis done by Phil Marshall uh, of his troops. And, you know, he identified that the leaders in, in, his, in his, his, his army, it was the Moltke, the Prussian uh, general at the end of the 19th century. And what he did was he analyzed people as either hardworking or not hardworking, lazy. Um, smart or not so smart. Um, and you put that in a quadrant. And what's really interesting, he said, the people who are hardworking and intelligent, they are very, very useful people. But your leaders, the one he wanted to actually delegate to that kind of leadership role, which is where we should be as project managers, are those that are um, intelligent and lazy because it's about finding the most efficient way to work, not necessarily just putting lots of hours in. I go back to my project managers, those two groups. One half were working crazy hours and being successful, but actually they weren't working in the most efficient way. And I made the same mistake. I worked on a project for a number of years and I and I learned from that because I was involved in every meeting, every decision, every conversation, every point had to involve me. And that's wrong. And so, you know, behind the, the kind of prioritization of what you should be doing, it is trusting your team, delegating the right things to your team, that kind of social inter interaction, that collaboration these days, not having everything as a, you, you as a central point, which effectively you become a blockage. It's your time limits everything else. So there's a lot of a lot of aspects around that, from communication to planning to structuring to team building, etc. And when I'm thinking about uh, laziness and productive productivity, productivity, um, the thing that comes to my mind is having fun at work and actually enjoying what we do. How can we do that? Is it possible in being uh, productively, productively, productively lazy? Or not really? <laughs> it is. I mean, the third book I wrote is the project manager who smiled because I realized there was some people like the lazy project manager because one, it's short, two, it's humorous, and three, it's very real. I talk about all the all the things I did wrong, um, whereas most project management books at that time were just per, pure theory of perfection, which are kind of boring to read. But I suddenly realized there were no books about project managers having fun. And, and you know, we're people as well. And we like to have fun. And I think it's very beneficial. Appropriate fun, suitable fun, you know, controlled fun in the sense of making sure that everybody is engaged and respectful of each other, particularly when you're working, you know, virtual groups, uh, multicultural, et cetera, multigender, et cetera. Or, you know, you have to be careful when it comes to humor. But. Let me give you one example of how um, I, you know I found it very useful. I was working with a group of people. Um, we never met. We never got together. It was a virtual team, um, and I discovered there is um, there are many days out there. Um, you know, for example, there is an International Project Management Day. But I discovered there's an uh, an International Speak Like a Pirate Day, which is very exciting. It's in September. And it's kind of, you You all become Johnny Depp in, um, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean and you say, yar and things like this. And it's crazy. But the first year we had a bit of fun with the core team. And I thought, this is brilliant. So the second year, what I did was I um, I sent out a uh, an inflatable parrot and an eye patch to all the team members around uh, Europe. And on that day, we, we spoke like a pirate. And if you go, you can check it out, speak like a pirate day. And there are translators. I don't know how many there are, but there were certainly in that day, there were German pirate, there was uh, French pirate, Spanish pirate, Irish pirate, etc. And you could translate emails and things. So by this sort of little bit of fun, we got some real connection with people, which is fantastic. One warning, one caveat here is make sure everybody's involved because one of the uh, guys in Germany got so carried away because we were talking about real work, but we're doing it in pirate language. Um, he forwarded an email onto his manager without explaining what was going on. So clearly his manager was a little bit confused about this pirate German email that came to him. So make sure everybody's involved in the fun. But it's just, it can be very, very useful. It's very connected. We, you know, we're humans and we like that kind of interaction. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so when you're talking about that team, I'm thinking about communication. How can we communicate in a team? And it doesn't matter if it's a remote team or it's a you know team in the office. Uh, how can we communicate to, to have some certain bond to feel comfortable with each other, but also to, to maybe smoothen the project management process? 
So I think uh, there's probably there's probably three aspects to this. The first thing, you know, the first one I would talk about is we are we're entering a world of social collaborative social media tools being used in a workplace, and that really helps. Um, so I wrote a book recently called the, the Social Project Manager, which explores all that, how we can use these tools to generate uh, better, faster communication, quicker decision making. That's fantastic. I think the other thing around this kind of team thing is. As a project manager, it is critical that you build what I call the visibility of purpose. Why are we doing this project? An example of this is, you know, you might be on my project team. Um, you're in a completely different country. Um, I ask you to do something. Your manager who sits just down the office from you asks you to do something. Who are you going to respond to? Well, you're going to respond to your manager probably because you're next to them. They can shout at you or tell you off or so. You know, they're your direct line manager. The most important thing for a project manager for their team is to explain why are we doing this project and get people buy into that, the visibility of purpose. What is the value of your contribution to this project and what is this project going to deliver? So I think that's the kind of second thing. And then the final one really is there are whole lots of tips and techniques out there as various articles I've written, blogs, et cetera, around uh, remote teams and virtual teams. But one thing I would say is if you're in a project or regular communication with a team, it can't be all push. It cannot all be Peter Taylor sitting in the UK talking to my project team. One of the tips I found is you change times, you know, timing of the meeting. So it's not always me having a nice, comfortable mid-afternoon call and other people having to stay up late at night or get up very early. Secondly, language. You make sure you slow down, repeat things, you use a lot of uh, images where possible. But finally, one of the great things is you you give ownership of that regular call to various team members around the world. And we, you know, we ask them to give some insight into their world, whether it's their culture, festivals, food, celebrations, what's going on in the office. You know, you, you connect people that way. It's not just them being remote members who have to attend and listen to a, a call that goes on for an hour and a half or whatever every week. You know, involve them, give them some ownership. So there's lots, you know, we can have, we can spend a couple of hours talking about this, but there's lots out there that you can look at um, with regard to virtual and remote teams. Yeah, and, and many people talk about, you know, that you have to engage people, et cetera, et cetera. But you kind of put it in that nice way that, uh, to dive into that culture, to to learn everything about other people. This is amazing because I've never actually uh, met anyone who talks about it uh, in that nice way. Uh, so what about uh, managing risk in project management? Do you mm -hmm. have any strategies, practices maybe? Well, you know, the, the problem with risk is, and I've seen it so many times is, uh, particularly when you're running projects um, inside organizations, you know, whilst every project is is unique and different, Many projects are very similar. One of the worst things of behavior I see is a project manager is given a new project. They decide to do their risk assessment, um, risk, you know, put together their risk management strategy and plan. And what they do is they go to their last project, they copy the risks out of that, and they paste them into the new project, and, oh, risk management done. Well, no, not really. One of the biggest benefits I've seen, uh, you know, so we skip to the end of a project, at the end of a project, there's always this, you should do lessons learned, you should do a retrospective, you should consider how you can improve things. And we all know life is so busy, uh, very challenging to do that. We've already started the next project, almost certainly. Um, nobody has a lot of time. But people talk about, well, we have all this intelligence that comes out of projects, we should share it. Well, the next challenge is, well, how do you do that? You know, particularly in a global environment with different languages, uh, you know, what was a, what was a good practice as opposed to just sorting problems out. One organization I worked with, all they did was they said at the end of a project, the project manager had to gather and report unexpected issues that occurred on the project and how did they deal with them. So effectively, this went into a very simple database that profiled the project, talked about the issue, talked about the actual you know, mitigation strategy that allowed new project managers to come along and go, oh, my project is like that one. It's similar to that one. I'm working in the same environment, the same country, the same uh, part of the organization. I will look at that list because it's not huge. And I can consider it add value to the potential risk and I can think about things. So that kind of uh, approach to risk of sharing knowledge, I think, is very, very valuable. Okay. It's not it's not just one person thinking about risk. It's lots of people thinking about risk. Yeah, it's like a teamwork and actually. Absolutely. Effect. Again, collaboration, sharing of that knowledge, because it is so, it is so much better to share at least one or two valuable points for a project 
them fail to share hundreds of learning points. And we know there are hundreds of learning points from each project, but you, you just don't have the mechanism to do that. Right, you're totally right. Um, I'd like to switch to the more creative part of the podcast and talk about your books. Um, because you're, you've written so many books, uh, for example, Get Fit with the Lazy Project Manager or the Lazy Project Manager, which is, I think, one of your most popular books. Yes. Uh, what inspires you to write those books? Well, I started because um, cause I actually I wanted to do more speaking. So, you know, I've now done over 350 presentations around the world, which is fantastic. But back in 2009, um, I talked to a few people and they said, well, it really helps if you have a book. Do you have any idea for a book? And I was very fortunate to find a publisher. They liked the idea of the Lazy Project Manager. And you know that one, it, it remains the most successful book I've ever written. But mm -hmm. you know, moving on from that one, it is, it is I just, I enjoy it. And, and there are two types of books are, are out that I've written. There are Ones are it's not truly research-based, but there's usually some surveys, some interviews. So things like Leading Successful PMOs is a slightly serious book um, based on some research that I did. And then there are the other books like Get Fit with a Lazy Project Manager, where I just sit down and, and I share some thoughts and ideas. I mean, Get Fit with a Lazy Project Manager is all pro about project health, health checks, audits, reviews, lessons learned, retrospectives, all those sort of things. So I just get inspired and I find them very easy to write because it's just me sitting down at my desk <laughs> with a laptop writing about my experience. Um, other books like you know, Strategies for Project Sponsorship, Lean Successful PMOs, Project Branding, they are, um, they are, they require more um, preparation, surveys, questionnaires, interviews, etc. And they're written in a slightly different way. But I just find writing a very um, enjoyable and natural experience. And people seem to like the voice I put out there. Um, and, you know, the rest is history, really. Yeah, and I have to say, I really enjoyed the book, The Lazy Project Manager. And it's the first book I've written from, from the list of your books. But um, my list of books to read is huge. So I'm definitely <laughs> going to take the other positions. Um, so what about the book? What about the books you read? So the books I read, they come in. Um, well, I read I read books for pleasure. So um, you know, they, you know, I love a good um, detective uh, pro etc. Yo Nesbo is one of my favourite writers right now in from uh, Norway. Um, I'm I'm sent a number of books these days for reviews etc. So they're kind of I'm, I'm happy to do what I can there as far as reading them and, and making recommendations. Um, but as far as business is concerned, I love books that just trigger something in me. And then when I when I speak and it's in the Lazy Project Manager, yeah, you know, books like Brian Tracy's Eat That Frog. Um, you know, about procrastination, about priorities and, and getting on with things. I love those books because they're so short and simple and entertaining, but actually they're quite stimulating. So that's one of my favorite books, Who Moved My Cheese, that kind of thing. These little short, sharp books are, are great. Um, and so anything like that, if I come across, I will uh, I will have a read. And if I like it, I'll go back and read it again slowly and I'll start to share it with people. And uh, yes, it's, it's you know, there's, there's, I like reading. There's a lot and I travel a lot. So I have a lot of time to read, uh, whether physically or audio. That's great. Um, I'd like to ask you if you have any tips for our listeners on project management and how to be a good, uh, lazy project manager. <laughs> oh, how I many? Well, there's so much. I mean, I think, you know, the biggest thing is always, I think, is in, uh, your time and communication, you know, the essence of project management is around time and communication. Um, you know, as far as your time is concerned, that is, you know, the essence of the lazy project manager. And it's about prioritizing your involvement, trusting your team, all that kind of thing. We've talked about that. But in the area of communication, it's really thinking smartly about communication. Um, it's a challenge for project managers because in reality, when you have all the stakeholders on a project, you have to communicate them in a way that works for every single individual. You cannot put together, and I, I talk about this um, in, my, in my presentations, about you can produce a 16-page report with the most beautiful diagrams and charts and images and beautiful fonts and layout, and it can have every single data point possible, and you send it to every single person in the company. The chances are that actually you've communicated to nobody. You've reported, but you've communicated. Communication works when it's the right information at the right time to the right person in the right way. <clears throat> and the mistake project managers often make, and many people, other people make as well, is they try and standardize communication to everybody. It doesn't work. So, you know, 
stakeholder number one might want a face-to-face -face meeting. Stakeholder two would like a five-box PowerPoint presentation. Stakeholder number three would like a telephone call. And stakeholder four might like an email bullet summary. Every is different. And whilst that may seem a lot of work, the cost of bad communication to a project manager and a project is terrible because it just it, it causes so much disruption, loss of time. You know, people get dispirited about the lack of progress. So you have to put, it's, you know, as I go back, right information, right time, right person, right way, get those four things correct. And then you have successful communication and actually your life is a lot simpler. So it's basically about an individual approach to every single person. It is. It is. I mean, yes, we have meetings. Yes, we share information and they're right and proper and, and that's going to kind of carry on. But when you're updating people, you have to think about it. So you cannot just put all your project information on, on a blog site or something like that and expect people to read it. That works for some people. It doesn't work for many people. So, you know, failure to communicate is not, not, not acceptable and it would just cause you problems as a project manager. So put the effort in. Okay, so it's good to remember that. Okay. And I have one last obligatory question to you. Yes. Basically, uh, sums up the interview, and it's connected with the name of the podcast. Stay on top of your work. How do you stay on top of your work? I stay on top of my work by uh, I do a little. A, a, I do a little, but I do it regularly. And I think an example of that is email. So you know, emails come in, and you, I hate I hate an, an inbox that gets, starts to get full. If I have more than 20 emails, I get very stressed. So I am I constantly are switching from one thing to another, just quickly looking at something. Do I need to deal with this? Can someone else deal with it? Do I need to file it for action later on? That kind of thing. And that's just my style. Uh, email, you know, when I'm writing, when I'm doing, you know, the PMO work, uh, calls, etc. I really don't like long, long time. I don't like a long time on anything. You know, a meeting that's more than 60 minutes is just crazy for my concern. So, you know, uh, short, sharp, constantly moving from one thing to the other. It works for me. I mean, that's just my style. Um, but other people have different approaches. Um, but for me, short, sharp, quick look at things, action where I can, prioritize, put a placeholder in my outlook for you know, action, etc., cetera, and, and away you go. Okay. That's a good uh, way to stay on top of your work. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining me here today. It was my pleasure to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Be lazy. This podcast was brought to you by Tenkan. You can listen to it on iTunes and SoundCloud. Subscribe to get more content and always stay on top of your work.